It is no secret that this year on Everest will go down as one of the deadliest in our history. By July 2022, 310 mountaineers have already lost their lives on the tallest peak in the world, and with 17 dead climbers in 2023 alone, the numbers have significantly increased. Some blame the dangers on global warming, while others seem to attribute the chaos on Everest being directly related to the increase of foot traffic. While this peak is a dream for many mountaineers, it is not without significant risks and challenges. Today we discuss a Hungarian climber, Zalard Suhajda, that would take the ultimate challenge of trying to conquer Everest solo. But not before coming face to face with the dangers of the tallest mountain in the world. This is his story. There have been concerns that the increased human activity at Everest Base Camp, which is located on the Kumbu Glacier, is making it unstable and unsafe. In order to cater to the demands of upwards of 400 climbers annually, about 1,500 people will come to base camp during the season, where luxury facilities can include massages and evening entertainment. According to a recent survey by The Guardian, Everest's glaciers have lost 2,000 years of ice in just the past 30 years. This has not gone unnoticed by experts or even the local community looking at the risk of keeping Everest Base Camp on the Kumbu Glacier. Just last year, there were talks of having Base Camp move off the thinning glacier to a safer location lower down on the mountain. Unfortunately, many Sherpas have voiced their disapproval with this change, as it would add three hours to the climb while also increasing the technical difficulty. This is a no-win situation, as moving the camp may delay the melting of the glacier, but increase the risk every climber must take, or not moving base camp will continue to harm the mountain. Currently, the community is still theorizing ways to move base camp, but not significantly increase the risk of climbing the mountain. A record-breaking 479 permits were granted, with reports of lines on Everest being up to 12 hours long in some cases. And it's easy to see why the government of Nepal is doing this, despite the risk and public backlash. The minimum payment for a permit is around 15,000 US dollars. But in recent years, Everest has become more of a tourist destination, with some thrill-seeking individuals willing to pay upwards of 60,000 US dollars just to be guided to the summit. However, I believe the fault falls in multiple areas, with one of them being the companies willing to accept payment from inexperienced climbers. These companies require no climbing experience, saying they will teach you everything needed, but the realistic fact is that if a client gets in trouble in high altitude, they can and will be abandoned to save the lives of others, as once you cross into the death zone, there is typically no way to help a struggling climber, even if a guide wanted to. Zalard Suhajda is not exactly what you would call a beginner climber. Originally from Bikishkaba, Hungary, he would start his climbing journey as a backpacker who just enjoyed long hikes. His passion would eventually lead him to hike along the Carpathians, Transylvania, and the Alps. From there, Suhajda would develop an interest in the alpine style of climbing, which is considered the most basic but pure form of mountaineering. An alpine climber does not use supplemental oxygen, nor do they carry large amounts of supplies on the peak. Typically, you will see them climb alone or in a pair, because the goal is to move as fast as possible. The increase in risk is obvious, and because of this, alpine-style climbers are made up of some of the most technically skilled and mentally tough individuals the sport has ever seen. Suhajda would end up summiting Mont Blanc, and this is where his love for mountaineering really grew to an obsession. In 2014, at the age of 31, he and a fellow Hungarian climber would summit Broad Peak, his first 8000er. In 2019, five years later, Suhajda would undertake his most difficult challenge to that point in his life, and summit the Savage Mountain, K2, becoming the first Hungarian to reach the peak. Suhajda would announce in early 2022 that he would focus his efforts on the top five tallest mountains in the world, and he would not wait long before conquering Lhotse in May of 2022, completely solo. Coming into 2023, he would be turning 40, and it was well known by family members that Suhajda's next mountain would be Everest. It can take years of planning to gather all the required documents and procedures, but Suhajda was finally ready. He had his permit, and would be attempting the peak on his own terms, 
once again solo. The summer months were fast approaching as all the Sherpas and porters began preparing Everest Base Camp for the climbing season, and many would notice that he was not a man of many words, but instead, as someone that was determined and focused on completing the task at hand, one thing was clear, he meant business. The climbing season on Everest started early this year, but the best time window to reach the summit was May 15th through May 26th. Suhajda knew this and would prepare accordingly. Leading up to the middle of May, he would make acclimatization trips on the mountain to get his body used to the high altitude conditions, and also set up camps for later use on his summit push. Acclimation climbs are essentially when an individual will climb to a desired point on a high altitude peak, rest, and return back to base camp. This process is repeated many times and allows the climber's body to become more accustomed to the lack of oxygen the higher up they go, above 8,000 meters or 26,000 feet. We start entering the atmosphere that contains little to no oxygen. Scientists have nicknamed this area the death zone due to the inability to sustain long-term life. Extended exposure in these areas, especially for a climber not using supplemental oxygen, is deadly. After many weeks of preparation, the Hungarian climber would set off from base camp on May 21st at 5,500 meters alone, with only the gear on his back and a radio that had a GPS beacon. The weather was perfect, there were no clouds in sight, the sun was bright, the blue sky towered over him, and the temperatures were on the warmer side. Well, for Everest anyways. All good indications for a mountaineer. Suhajda would be loosely following the popular South Kal route from Nepal, and there were many expeditions following the same path up the mountain. Experiencing delays in certain bottleneck areas could not be avoided, but being a solo climber definitely has its advantages when trying to move around larger crowds. With more people on the mountain, there would inevitably be more trash as well, and Suhajda definitely noticed this. Everest used to be an untouched part of nature that was mystical and challenging, but today there are areas covered in debris left behind, further representing just how much expeditions on this mountain have changed. Suhajda would climb like this for three days. He was careful, not wanting to make simple mistakes. The climb was mentally and physically taxing, almost more than what was originally expected. Every night, he would find the small ledge where he had previously set up his makeshift campsites and pitch his tent, slowly making progress up the mountain until on May 24th, he was ready for a summit push. That morning, Suhajda would rise early from his tent, well before the sun had risen. As predicted by the weather experts below, today truly seemed to be a perfect day to reach the summit of Everest. Although still dark, the sky was clear of any clouds, there was no wind, and the temperature was relatively warm. After getting a bite to eat, he started his journey upwards. By 7.30 a.m., Suhajda had climbed up to the balcony on Everest, but his body was deteriorating quickly in the death zone. Suhajda's energy levels were just not what he was used to, and it was increasingly difficult to keep his mind clear as the lack of oxygen began playing tricks. Ben Ferrer, a member of the Seven Summits climb team, was returning from the summit when he came across Suhajda sitting alone on the balcony. They would exchange greetings and Suhajda would ask Ben for the altitude. Ben replied, 8,400 meters, and would notice how tired he sounded. Ben thought Suhajda was asking for the altitude to inform his team of his turning around point, but this was the wrong assumption. Before Ben left, he would take a picture of Suhajda, never imagining this would be the last visual record of the man. It was not until six hours later until we hear about Suhajda again. This time, another mountaineer, Canadian Elias Sakali, would pass by Suhajda much later in the day near 4 p.m. He had made some progress since he was last spotted by Ben, climbing about 300 meters. Elio would attempt to talk to Suhajda, but for the most part was ignored. This was concerning, as the sun was beginning to set and the wind had picked up. It was too late in the day to reasonably continue for the summit. Suhajda did not say a word as he passed Elia. He just kept walking. There really was nothing that could be done. Elia would continue his descent, but as he climbed, he thought back on the situation and realized that Suhajda did not have a backpack with him. This meant that he would have no supplies if stuck on the mountain, which only solidified Elia's thought that Suhajda would not be returning. However, right before Elia lost vision of the summit, he looked up 
and saw Suhajda only a few meters below the peak. Overnight contact with Suhajda was lost, besides a random GPS ping right under the Hillary Step at 8,790 meters. A Chinese climber in his Sherpa would reach the summit of Everest the next morning and notice Suhajda laying down off the well-beaten route. He was not tied to any fixed line. In order to reach his location, the Sherpa would need to traverse a dangerous section. It was reported that Suhajda was in fact alive at this time, but suffering from frostbite and high altitude sickness. Unfortunately, the Sherpa was unable to assist, as his own Chinese client was heavily struggling himself, and thus Suhajda was left on the mountain. After hearing the news back at base camp that Suhajda was still alive, a team of three Sherpas were quickly put together. The team would be taken by helicopter to Camp 2, and from there would work their way up to Suhajda's last known location. It would take about six hours to reach their destination, and under normal circumstances, this journey would take about 18 hours to traverse. The Sherpas set out on May 26 from Camp 2, two days after Suhajda's summit push, and one day since he was last seen alive. When the team of Sherpas arrived at his last known location, he was nowhere to be found. They would search all day, even looking at the summit, but ultimately the search would be called off, and Suhajda was pronounced dead, although they would never find his body. What is interesting about this story is that it turns out that Suhajda never left with his gear on May 24th. His clothing and tent were found by a Sherpa back near Camp 2, indicating he was pushing for the summit quite literally with only the clothes on his back. From record-breaking permits to global warming, and even the amount of trash being left behind, it is clear that in recent times, Everest has changed. Well, maybe not Everest, but those willing to try and conquer it. Hungarian climbers, Zalard Suhajda's story only brings more light to these troubling issues, but also once again, shows the dangers of a mountain like Everest.